Can I give it 10 more seconds? Okay, uh, so good morning, uh, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, Felicity Care is pleased to present you uh, with our second webinar, which is focusing on the mental health of employees. My name is Richa Bakshi. Uh, I uh, lead the, the supply chain HR function for Procter & Gamble in India. Uh, and I've been uh, working in the corporate world now for 12 years. Um, I will be the moderator for this session. I would request you at, uh, to post your questions at any time in the chat box, which is provided uh, on, on the YouTube uh, page that you're viewing. The questions we will answer towards the end and they will be directed to the panelists. Also, as I said earlier, we will pick the best questions uh, and uh, that question will get uh, free therapy, uh, you know, through Felicity. So please do send in your questions through the session as and when you have them. Uh, we will also be conducting a webinar every other week. So please subscribe and follow our social media pages and uh, do send in your suggestions for any future webinars for real-time updates. Right? Thank you uh, to the panelists, all our esteemed panelists at the beginning itself for taking out the time and for being part of this webinar. We really appreciate it. You know, it's a Sunday, so you have your families at home. And to everyone who is watching this live, I hope you and your loved ones are safe and well. And thank you very much for joining us. So with that, what I will do is just introduce our uh, amazing panel. Uh, so first we have Aditya, Aditya Velor. Aditya has worked in HR since 2004. And uh, he's actually one of those people who found his passion early and uh, has stayed invested and passionate about his career, despite considering himself an introvert, which he says is odd, <laughs> uh, but not uncommon for someone in HR. Sorry, just one second. Oh, sorry, that was my daughter. And this is a normal part of working from home, as you <laughs> all <laughs> would be well aware. So uh, Aditya has worked across various HR disciplines. He's worked in talent acquisition, business partnering, employee engagement, mergers and acquisitions, and of course, uh, leadership development and HR strategy. His current role is as chief of staff, and he supports the HR leader for the greater Asia region for Intel, which, which comprises approximately 36,000 employees across all locations in Asia. Our second uh, panelist is Colonel Ajay Ramakrishnan, who actually has the Sena Medal, uh, uh, Gallantry Sena Medal, and has served the army, the Indian army, from 1988 to 2010. He's also a veteran of the Cargill War uh, and has been a commercial uh, rotocraft pilot and also has, uh, has, has had success as a success and transformation coach. Uh, during his service with the Indian military, he served with the infantry, with the army aviation, special forces, air force establishments, and the navy. It's quite a, uh, quite a diverse uh, set. And he is also, obviously, in his recent, uh, not recent, but in, in his uh, corporate career, also uh, crafted training programs for various multinational organizations like Microsoft, Accenture, SAP, ITC, Titan, etc. Uh, you can also find him on LinkedIn and uh, check out his website at ajayramakrishnan.com. And our third panelist is uh, Preeti Majki, Dr. Preeti Majki, who's a clinical psychologist and has an MPhil and a PhD from Nimhans in mindfulness-based stress reduction programs. She has 15 years of uh, counseling and training experience in esteemed organizations uh, such as Nimhans, Istro, and Bosch. And for the last eight years, she has worked as a social counselor at uh, Robert Bosch Engineering and Business Solutions. And she currently heads the counseling team which focuses on mental health awareness and prevention through various initiatives uh, for or employees and managers, and also obviously specifically individual counseling needs with employees. Uh, and also, of course, she's part of the company's uh, posh committee and manages the end-to-end -end company, the wellness program for the company. So thank you once thank again, you. all of you, for joining us and uh, very diverse experience and obviously, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of... Uh, a uh, lot of experience and very diverse. So uh, I'm sure we'll bring in a lot of diverse perspective. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I will direct a question to each of you and then we'll have some common questions, uh, you know, for discussion across the panel. So Colonel Rajay, if I could start with you. Um, sure. We know that, uh, you know, 46% today of private sector employees are actually reporting 
based on recent data and especially i think during the covid times extreme stress uh, you know because of work and as a result of that i think we are also seeing a dip in performance levels in some cases or a self reported dip in performance levels right and we all know that work is something which is so integral and you know we can't really it's an integral part of our lives right according to you how does this affect you know a mental health of a person right and what are the organizational factors both positive and negative that could affect the mental health of employees who work there colonel <clears throat> ajay over to you sure thank you so much uh, richa for firstly for that uh, lovely introduction and uh, for this uh, beautiful event that you guys have organized now looking at uh, an individual let's look at a person's life you know in a corporate first thing how does he or she make choices to join that career the stress starts from there there's a study which says 93% of indians children and parents choose careers based on the perks and privileges which they are going to get in the career rather than their you know proclivity or capability or strengths that will match that career career is just in terms of money that itself is the first source of stress move further the work environment is competitive it will always be so but now i am competitive in a field where which is not my primary strength i am competing with you you are working on your primary strength i am competing with you on my secondary strength i will always be under stress this is self created next ambition we have our ambitions we need to get them in sync with the organization our capabilities and what life has to offer the term work life balance is something we indians especially only read about it we don't apply to it now this is as far as the individual is concerned now there was also a world economic forum report in 2018 or 19 which said that with the way the world of work is changing every year an individual will require 30 to 50 hours of upskilling i am not investing in myself i am not upskilling myself obviously i'm going to be lagging behind and that's going to cause me more stress now these are the individual points which i uh, you know sort of uh, put together now we look at it from the organization's point of view very few organizations in this day and age have time for people who are not putting an effort themselves hand holding is fine but first you have to extend that hand for the organization to hold having said that a few things which an organization can do especially in this day and age the first thing is this work from home uh, is something which has been thrust upon us and we have not yet actually analyzed it and compartmentalized it the way we should for example uh, i'll deal with it later as well we need to be able to dealing from our workspace we are not you're saying 8 hours 8 waking hours at work not enough you spend 2 hours before that worrying about the emails and what you're going to do in the day okay 2 plus 8 10 you you're spending another 2 hours after work wondering about all the stuff which has come up and piled up on your in your inbox right 12 hours gone even if you sleep for just 6 hours you just got 6 hours left and then you got another day coming up so these are the things which are affecting us and organizations can help us how by delinking at the right time making it a formal structure that you when you are working from home the flexibility should be limited to a particular time span and they should factor in the uh, imponderables which happen as part of the reflective process or the preparative process for the next day the two hours before two hours after so in essence what i'm saying is something like if you're saying eight hours of work let's reduce it to five hours Three hours get added on for that person to reflect because he's not delinking. He's thinking about. It. Plus, the next big step which organizations can do is to 
promise certain amount of job security today everyone is so scared of losing their jobs that they are working like rabbits trying to prove their efficiency prove their capabilities it is playing on their minds so organizations like i think tata has said that uh, no one's going to lose their job because of the pandemic even uh, i think uh, one of the uh, good companies have come out with this very early these are the steps uh, types of initiatives which companies need to take thank you thank you i think uh, absolutely and i think it's also uh, you know important somewhere for uh, to invest more in wellness and uh, you know to actively managing uh, you know uh, mental well being uh, because you also need that supporting structure and like you said it should also be okay for employees to reach out and uh, you know ask for that help right and uh, i'd like to you know uh, also just at this point that they take your point of view right uh, so how how do you think companies today right uh, are invested in this and not only just wellness right but more in terms of mental health because i think what we are recognizing more and more is that mental health is so critical uh, you know especially in the, in the situations of stress right so how do you think are are companies doing enough is there more that you know the corporate wellness teams can do and uh, is it is it really today an organizational priority to worry about the mental health of uh, you know uh, employees thanks acha uh, i'll just try to build on from what colonel ajay spoke about earlier right i think he brought in a couple of important pointers in terms of what corporates are doing and can do uh, and i'll speak from my experience of having worked at uh, intel through the pandemic and what we've done as an organization and rely mostly on that but i've also seen this across many many organizations in our uh, comparator set right i think mm-hmm. the first thing is um, the last couple of years i've been very very pleasantly surprised in terms of how the conversation on mental mental wellness has become so important in corporates right i think people are finally acknowledging that this is a topic which is important for us to focus on and thinking about resources which they can provide employees with so which is a huge positive step and this started happening before the pandemic and of course uh, during the pandemic like uh, kanal ajay said there have been multiple f- other factors which have made this very important to for corporates to focus on um so to give an example of what we've done in intel we've uh, we've always given 24/7 support to employees who need uh counseling support uh, we've also extended to their families now so any employee or their family member who needs counseling support can reach out to that it's 24/7 365 days a year across the globe uh the second thing we've done is we've tied up with multiple organizations which provide wellness resources uh mm-hmm. including apps which are there specifically for wellness right one of the apps is focused on meditation so all you have to do is just kind of log into the app and then it takes you through multiple steps of meditation kind of tells you how many you know minutes you focused on it so on and so forth right so this is another opportunity which we provided of course healthcare is very important and that's been a cause of concern for a lot of individuals during this pandemic so what we've done is we've extended um healthcare facilities as much as possible to cover various instances of where it's required uh given the structure of the pandemic right uh the fourth thing is through the soft what i call soft initiatives you can do within the company right uh you have organizations like ours which are spread across uh you know 150 countries 120000 employees so it's not possible for us to reach out to all employees at all points of time right so that's why managers become very important so what we've also done is to invest in the capability of managers to be able to kind of lead their teams during the pandemic to make sure that they have the best practices resources the structure the infrastructure available for them to actually take their teams through what could be a very traumatic experience for some of the individuals right so this is what we've done and i've also seen companies do a lot uh, of similar stuff Uh, i i know that also this is a trigger which has kind of widened the divide between haves and have nots and that's also been seen in the corporate world right some companies are cash rich and are able to kind of uh, pivot their resources some companies may not be that fortunate and they've been impacted because of the fact that they are in a certain industry so i must call out that that's something i've also seen so uh, this may be uh, reflective of certain industries only right uh, but i'm i'm overall very positive in terms of the direction corporates have taken uh, 
is everything done? Absolutely not. We can do a lot more. Um, but I would say mental wellness, if I were to call out two things which corporates need to keep investing in, mental wellness definitely. The second I would call out again is manager capability because managers have to be the, the face of the organization to the individuals. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's, a, that's a, uh, a great point because actually uh, a lot of people also report uh, that they feel that they've experienced mental health symptoms, uh, you know, uh, and they feel that they've, and, and I'm talking specifically now things like depression or, uh, you know, anxiety or PTSD, etc. And they, they're feeling that all the time. And to adjust, uh, you know, as we were talking earlier, that this is now almost like a continuous day-to-day -day thing where we're under stress, right? And Preeti, at this point, I'd like to bring you in, you know, because uh, I think what, like to bring in Adi's point, Aditya's point as well, that how, how what, what do managers do, right? Because I think as a manager myself, it's sometimes really hard to pick up, right, on uh, that someone is either mentally stressed or, uh, and I don't think we're normally very sensitive about that. And it's sometimes looked at as a sign of weakness, right? So what do leaders, organizational leaders, organizational managers, right? What are the things that they can actively do? And what are the things that we should be telling them, uh, you know, as, uh, or HR or organization should be telling them to enable employees either to report, ask for help, uh, you know, and create a supportive uh, environment, which is not toxic or where it's not looked down upon to come and ask for help or, you know, seek support from the company where you spend basically 50% of your life. So Preeti, any perspective? Preeti, you're on mute. Uh, we can't hear you. If you could just unmute yourself, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Richa, and thank you, Facility, for this opportunity and the very uh, valid points uh, made by Kanal Ajay and Aditya. So, um, yes, uh, managers are the most important uh, part of the whole structure of the organization. And, and since the time I'm working in corporate as a counselor, that has always been my objective to train managers and make them, uh, you know, equip them with the right skills to identify the associates at the right time when there is an issue and also to know the do's and don'ts, uh, what they're supposed to be doing, because sometimes, uh, you know, we cross the line and that's when we have to be careful. And then when is the right time to refer? Okay. So we have built a, a training on this uh, whole uh, topic uh, for managers and we have covered thousands of managers on this topic, especially the, the numbers have increased. I mean, these training numbers have increased uh, during the pandemic. And we have been doing this training for uh, manager sensitization, where we train them to basically uh, aware, make them aware what how mental health looks like and what are the signs and symptoms to pick it up from and what is the general scenario in the in the world. And then it goes on to, you know, what are the do's and don'ts which they have to be careful about. Like, for example, sometimes we get so involved as a manager because we don't know what to do. We get so involved ourselves and it starts affecting us. So where to draw the line? how to talk to them, where to stop, and how to be transparent. Because sometimes it happens that the associate gets dependent on you. And because you have been talking so nicely to this person, they think that they're going to solve my problem. Okay, which is not the case because any manager or any HR is not a trained counselor and they can help only to a certain extent. And if it goes beyond that, it can actually do more harm than good. Okay, and that's where it's really important to draw the line and the training basically helps them with that. So how to talk to them and how to tell them that I'm sorry, uh, you know, after this, I don't think I can help you because I'm not uh, trained or equipped enough. I would rather refer you to somebody. But how to have the gentle uh, follow ups on or to talk to the associate just to show that you care and you're concerned, but not being too inquisitive about it at the same time. So these are very finer uh, lines, which, you know, comes naturally. And also a bit of uh, sensitization helps. And after that, you know, how, how they can refer. Because most of the time, associate will say, nothing is wrong with me. I mean, are you call, calling me mad or something? You know, so that's, that's again, that's another point where manager always find, you know, difficulty in how to refer. Because when the associate says no. So that's the time we kind of tell them that, okay, uh, you know, you don't have to really push because this is something that is voluntary uh, for, the associate, uh, for the associates or employees to reach out to take help. But, you know, how to gently uh, make them aware, connect some stories and bring that rapport between the manager and the employee and gently refer. And if they're still not willing, uh, leave it up to them. I mean, they can take their own time to recover, but give a timeline. 
you know it's important to give a timeline otherwise they can take their own sweet time and not take help at all but once you decide on a timeline and if the employee has not recovered or not come back to his normal of performance or whatever it is then it's time that you have to push it and say you have to take this because you don't see you know uh, improvement in what we decided and mutually was decided and that's when the employee gets referred so most of the time i mean i've been in this industry for more than you know 10 years now most of the time uh, uh, the denial is less i mean the employees do agree that okay i would go and take help there's hardly 0.5 or 1 percent of the associates who say no 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 i don't want to take help okay so it's very less but even with that we kind of equip and how, we also tell how to refer so basically how do you write a mutual mail to an uh, you know to an counselor and an associate introducing both of us so that they they feel that comfort and also to reiterate on the confidentiality that's very important because when the associate is referred by the manager they already have this you know what if the manager gets to know everything so the manager is also equipped to kind of reiterate that confidentiality that even though if i'm asking you to go and talk to the counselor i would not know anything about what you're talking so don't you worry about it unless there's something that i need to know it will be done with your consent and once the associate comes to us we again build on that conf- confidentiality and and make sure it is uh, you know it's it's part of the ethics i mean there is no two way about it and and that's how uh, we go forward so with this training that i see from the last uh, i mean where i said the numbers have increased so there i can see that managers are more comfortable the percentage of the cases referred uh, to the counselor from the managers are increased and i can see that managers are able to uh, Uh, you know bring in uh, the right kind of help at the right time and not delaying too much and that really helps in quick recovery of the person mm-hmm. and getting back to work yeah so this is what i wanted to say about your question yeah and and you know to your point right so how do you how does one or either leaders or organizations spot when something is wrong right like how do we know uh, you know when to when do we need to intervene because sometimes it's not that obvious right we're talking like yeah, essentially yeah. 20% uh, of the workforce right yeah so actually not 20 the people? numbers have got gone up i mean recent study even mm-hmm. said up to 90% 90% wow. of the associates will require mild i mean they are on the mild level of anxiety or depression especially on from the onset of the pandemic so yes so the so the training actually uh, we talk about the signs and symptoms like if you see mm-hmm. an associate not being their normal self that is how they were before and if they are seeing them not okay as in either they are crying too much or they you are finding them lonely or they are very restless and they are making more errors and if you see some change in the associate which is very important to know is consistently present for more than 2 weeks this is the timeline okay so the 2 weeks more than 2 weeks is the associate is not doing okay for us to diagnose it requires 3 weeks but if for the for the manager to see if it is lasting if the associate who was like you know who was very talking and very interactive is turned into a different person or getting very angry easily or you find him alone or her alone or crying getting tearful easily if you see any change lasting for 2 weeks okay so that's most important consistently because most of the time we also feel upset but we bounce back by the end of the day or after a couple of days but if it's lasting more than a week or even if it's going to two weeks definitely it's the point that okay you have to talk to the associate build that rapport with the associate that you're really concerned and 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 sorry i mean once you talk to the associate they feel comfortable then you refer so that that rapport is very important between the manager and the hr manager and the employer hr or, or, or the employee so that symptoms it's, what are those symptoms is also is listed so these are the basic anxiety and depression symptoms there are symptoms of little at a higher level when people an associate starts feeling that uh, you know uh, he's being watched and he gets very suspicious or she gets very suspicious about people around them they think that their computer or their mobile is being tapped or tracked you know and it's consistently lasting for more than 2 weeks these are the time that okay uh, this is not to be delayed anymore and is to be referred to the counselor so this is the two points that's it's important to remember thanks thank thank you thank you uh, thank you thank so you actually, yeah. to to that point actually and i think uh, colonel lachya also mentioned it earlier that uh, you know we've had a lot of potential layoffs right and people are more stressed because of uh, you know the number of people uh, uh, companies are laying off right for whatever obviously either due to the pandemic or maybe not due to the pandemic but using this as an opportunity Uh, you know the streamlining etc right and obviously this is in india and globally 
Uh, so Aditya, I think uh, for you, uh, just you know, any perspective or you have uh, where how can um, and I think this would just cause incremental stress, right? So any advice uh, to HR leaders or organizational leaders, you know, at this time in terms of how do you uh, you know maintain confidence in the company, or, you know, retain the culture, protect the culture actually, and at the same time. Uh, you know, you're making such big organizational decisions. So, any advice for organizational leaders or HR leaders who have to who are dealing with uh, these kind of issues? Sure, sure. I think it's a very pertinent question, and I think, like Ajay Kanaja mentioned earlier, some organizations uh, have taken the stance saying that we will whatever happens, we will not uh, impact the workforce. But yeah. you know, unfortunately, some organizations are in industries which are so badly impacted and so badly crippled that they will probably have to kind of uh, make some of those cuts, right? Um, and we have to be cognizant of the fact that this is the reality today. Uh, for those organizations which are going through this, I would say one thing is never forget that the person on the other side is a human being. Right. Um, you may be doing this as a program. You may be doing this in terms of number of people you have to kind of give out letters to or have conversations with, but never undercall the emotions and the sentiment involved in it. Uh, and this is drawing from my personal experience. Right. I, I've always I've done multiple of these in various organizations um, and but fortunately not during the pandemic time. Right. Uh, because that adds a different layer of uh, complexity. But before the pandemic, I've done this multiple times and I've I've seen that the the way you can actually minimize the uh, the trauma or the impact of this is by being a completely transparent in the process, uh, and by be by being you know available to the employee who's been impacted, and by acknowledging the fact that the person is. Uh, a human being and is going through a certain amount of emotions and trauma, right? Uh, that's very important. So I would say if there are organizations which have to go through this, please invest resources in terms of increasing the size and strength of your HR teams uh, because HR plays a very important role. Uh, you cannot come back and say that one of my HRBP supports 1,500 employees, so it, it, you know he or she will not have the capacity or the capability to support all of them. That's not an excuse. Right, invest in resources uh, because end of the day, it is the individual is getting impacted, and we have to kind of make sure that the individual goes through the right experience. Uh, the second thing is in terms of uh, post, uh, you know, uh, post whatever the transaction support or post layoff support. Right, I would say two things which organizations have typically done is one is to kind of tie up with uh, other recruitment firms where they've been able to kind of identify opportunities for them. Uh, honestly, in my experience, uh, these firms have been pretty poor in terms of their support, right? Whenever I've seen that. So I would say, again, this is where the organization needs to play a very important role. And this would be HR BPs and leaders of the organizations will be impacted, right? They need to reach out to their uh, networks. They need to reach out to their contacts and make sure that that information in terms of where somebody's hiring, what are the jobs available, uh, helping people kind of make that connection, helping, uh, helping people refer others, that's something which they need to do. Uh, the third thing I would urge organizations to do is in terms of investing in healthcare support, right? Mm -hmm. I think the biggest uh, trigger of stress right now is if I lose my job, will my healthcare cover go away? Not only for me, but also for my family, right? Uh, in India, yeah. it will be dependence in terms of your parents. Uh, and we know how expensive it is now to get health insurance for uh, senior parents, right? Uh, outside the, the system of corporate insurance. Mm -hmm. So... I would urge the organizations to ensure that even if they have to do the restructuring or layoffs, ensure that the coverage for healthcare stays for at least a period of time, right? For the end of their financial year or whatever it is, uh, till a logical com uh, time comes into play. So these are three things I would call out. Invest in terms of your HRBP resources and your HR resources so that you can maintain uh, individual and uh, you know personal connect with the individuals who are being impacted. Second is in terms of uh, providing recruitment services and support, uh, but making it more structured and the third is healthcare. Uh, thank you, Aditya. Uh, Colonel Ajay, what about, uh, you know, you were talking about earlier companies, uh, anything else you think uh, companies need to be more cognizant of or individuals, either at an organizational level or at an individual level? Uh, what is your perspective? Thank you so much, uh, Richard. And firstly, I think uh, Preeti and Aditya have covered some fantastic points and I just hope somebody takes these uh, as action points and gets onto them. Aditya's point on uh, healthcare for parents is such a such a you know a huge pressure on a person. Yes. 
so i think the amount of stress that's going to cause is going to be much more than me contacting covid then uh, i'll be more worried about my parents so having said that uh, some time back i did uh, uh, write a blog on this mm-hmm. it is and it's called leading in times of ctsd mm-hmm. continuous trauma stress disorder which is what we are in we are continuously under stress whether you are a manager or you are a line worker or you are anybody this has not spared any one of us we are all equally vulnerable right so having said that what are the biggest casualties or problems which have come about because of this we need to identify that the first thing is trust companies spend billions of dollars and rupees trying to build trust in their employees covid has ensured that trust has just gone out of the window yeah why our one to one interactions have almost ceased now i don't trust you because i do not know what game you are playing behind my back i might get fired because of what you are reporting about me so what aditya brought in about transparency it's a very critical aspect because our trust deficits have increased faith we need to have faith in our organization it is the onus lies on a leader to instill faith on in his people it's not the other way around that's a by product so as preeti brought out the actions being taken by her managers and the way she's training managers this also is an aspect which they need to look into right now uh, some of the very small uh, points which i have shared in this blog especially related to my military experiences under stress all managers need to really sit down and probably even make a pen picture of each of their employees how they visualize them what are their triggers how they behave what are the touch points they can look forward to in their behavioral changes unless you have a datum how will you understand the change yeah. and uh, it is i personally feel it is asking too much for one manager to let's say do this for you know 20 30 employees of his team it's not uh, realistic so what we do in the army is that we create very very small teams of two or three people and we call them buddy pairs mm-hmm. so it's like there are five of us here two of us become a buddy pair remaining three become or remaining two become another buddy pair and we are constantly monitoring each other talking to each other communicating with each other and we are a support system for each other okay this is something which can be done based on uh, previous relationships which were there in the corporate structure it need not be horizontal it can be vertical as well it can be diagonal we just need to open our mind that this is a new situation we are in we need to work things differently as a manager i need to understand what are the emotional challenges which are likely to come up managers are trained to deal with organizational challenges they are trained to deal with financial or regulatory challenges we all need to go back to our books and start reading daniel goleman's uh, emotional intelligence and see how we can apply it to the work pay, workplace okay. we really really need to get out of our designations and become human beings that is the absolute bottom line completely agree and i think that uh, that the whole uh, actually research is also i think now saying this a lot more that uh, in the like say 20 years ago uh, there was a lot of hierarchy a lot of bureaucracy and uh, as a result i think people weren't fully there or fully engaged right so i think the uh, it's changing to how it's important organizations need to be more empathetic managers need to engage more etc and i i, I do feel that it's 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 a journey and it's very hard to uh, you know pivot and uh, a lot of the, if you compare the old school versus you know the new school uh, especially you know the whole millennial conversation you're seeing this whole bunch of people who also don't have any or uh, you know the loyalty is also sort of going away right so you don't have any i mean you can basically have so many choices etc and then 
that's where relationships and one on one equations become so important and which is where managers are uh, uh, you know play a, play a big role so i think a uh, great points uh, you know all of you thank you uh, for all of that <clears throat> uh, you know perspective so i think just to broadly summarize uh, before we get into a few more questions uh, so i think at an organizational level um, we're seeing that uh you know companies do need to structurally invest in a lot of uh, key uh, initiatives or programs right uh to protect and to ring fence uh, both employees uh, you know and and the broader ecosystem right we do need to uh, get managers involved actively in the conversation right we need to invest in them build their capability so they can manage you know their broader teams well i think somewhere we need to create a culture where it is okay uh, for people to come and talk to report to share uh, we also need to have systems and processes and by that i largely mean benefits or uh, you know structural uh, uh, policies etc which gives some i think ring fence some critical uh, either benefits or uh, you know like insurance or how do we treat employees once they leave all uh, all with the objective keeping in mind the whole trust and psychological safety uh, you know so people uh, don't feel that their jobs are under threat all the time right? so i think some of those things uh, uh, companies need to actively do and from a person standpoint though and i think that's where uh, you know uh for individuals today right as individuals working in companies how do we what do i do right and i think we we also i think mentioned that earlier that i i should reach out i i should uh, you know as an individual what do, what can we do more especially in this new weird situation that we're kind of in right because i think a lot of the power the dynamics have all shifted as we work from home right you're not in that organizational setting anymore right So, what do individuals do, like as employees, right? With not a manager, not a leader, but what do I, as an individual, do? Uh, you no know, differences. And I'll open it up for anyone, any one of you who would like to comment. Uh, how do I manage today? Uh, you know, where I'm sitting at home, not meeting people. Uh, you know, uh, I don't have someone on my back all the time at one end, but at the same time, I need to manage all the dynamics. Uh, you know the structure as well as manage my home routine, which is very challenging, right? So, what advice would uh, would you have? And any yeah. one of you can respond. Okay, this is in fact uh, you took the words right out of my mouth. By when you were talking about, uh, so far we are only only talking about organizations doing stuff, right? Yes. For a moment, let's forget organizations. in the end it is my survival it is your survival if we do not realize it at this point of time then we are doomed so if we have to survive if you and i four of us have to survive we have to work together right so how do we do that first individually we plan our day we make sure that we factor in a lot of holistic stuff which we've been hearing of you know meditation exercise spending time with family members a lot of us make the mistake of uh, having a workplace and our cooking place and our family place mixed up together let's become professional about it this is my office space i'll dress up as i'm going to office i'll sit down here and i'll do my bit for the day okay and i have already prepared lunch for my husband for my wife or for my grandparents or children my child is also busy and i have tried to do something for, to keep the child engaged yes it will happen because mates and help are not there these days those small things are okay but the big things we should be able to uh, structure for ourselves if we can structure and take control of our own daily routine that control will lead to a great deal of confidence and that confidence will in turn lead to better performance which in turn will lead to better job security better blah 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 that list carries on okay so the change has to start from oneself 
Now, the what can you do externally? Okay, I am feeling down. I am feeling depressed. I am not happy. I have been lonely for too long. Hey, there's a friend of mine in the other department. Let's give her a call. Pick up the phone. Talk to that person. Talk anything excepting your work. Reach out to people. Make Set across time in your daily routine to talk to at least five different people over the day. Have a Zoom meeting where your old team, you can you guys can get together and just chill. What's stopping us? And there's nothing stopping us in our free time to even go and visit somebody. As long as we maintain social distancing, we wear our masks and uh, we wash our hands. Nobody's stopping us. So we also need to do a bit. Corporates, whether they do, when they do, how they do is a different issue. Eventually, I have to survive. Richard, I'm just going to add on to a little bit yeah. of this. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I'll take the liberty of disagreeing with Colonel Ajay a little bit on this. Uh, because one of the things which I've noticed in the last six to eight months is this, uh, uh, you know, the focus on control. Because end of the day, there's so many things which we are not able to control in this situation. So I think it's also important for us to be okay with situations which are not under control, right? Uh, just to kind of draw on Richard's experience, you know, I just came in at the beginning when uh, we started off the conversation. But that's the reality. You'll have, you know, you'll have kids in the background. You'll have parents you need to attend to. You'll have a lot of other pressing commitments. Um, I would say we need to practice empathy towards each other for such situations, right? These are completely not under control. Uh, and I would say be okay with that control because, uh, you know, I'm somebody who loves control, right? I like to put structure into everything I do, my day, my work, my interactions with people, so on and so forth. But I think that's one thing I've realized during the pandemic that that's absolutely not possible, right? That's one thing. The second thing is I think we need to individually figure out what works for us, right? Um, so, for example, it could be meditation, it could be faith, it could be exercise, it could be reading. It, a lot of people cook to relieve the stress, right? So I think individually figure out what's your one thing which you need to do um, and take time away for that, right? For me, it, it's just about spending 30 to 45 minutes watching a Netflix series at the end of the day. And to be honest with you, because I do two roles, that's pretty much the time I get for myself, right? So, but that's so important to break the stress. Yeah. And maybe yeah. I think, uh, sorry, go ahead, Preeti. Yeah, so I was just trying to kind of bring both the points together, what uh, Kanala Jai said and uh, Aditya was telling. Uh, whenever I do, uh, you know, the stress management programs for our colleagues and these are, the, uh, these are the topics that is generally discussed. I mean, forget about manager, what do I do to myself, you know, I don't, I don't can't, really can't control what manager would do to me, but let me take care of myself. So I generally what, uh, I mean, it's the same points which both of have covered, but try to put them into two categories, basically, that helps us to bring down the stress automatically as soon as we, you know, put it into two categories. I mean, when we try to see everything together, it looks like a big mountain of so many things to be done. But as soon as you break it into two, that is, these things are under my control, I can do something about it. Let me put that into that basket. And there's another basket which is beyond my control. I really can't do anything about it. It's unchangeable. Okay. So as soon as we divide these two, already that mountain is broken into half. And I have just this mountain to deal with, not the rest. Rest will happen. I mean, take its own time to get better acceptance and other things that we could do that we just spoke about. The things which I can do is the only thing that uh, I need to be worrying about and and apply problem solving strategies, communication, assertiveness, whatever soft skills that we, we learn during our uh, different trainings. So apply those things and solve that because it is under your control. Rest of it, which you cannot do much about it, do other things, talking to people, uh, you know, use uh, faith or, uh, you know, whatever, you know, exercise these things that will take its own time to heal. So, but first is divide the problem and make sure that it's not the whole thing that you have to deal with it at one time. It's only that small portion and just let's focus on that. That itself will bring down quite a bit of our anxiety on, you know, how to manage. Yes, that's about it. Absolutely. And I think, like, uh, it's also based on the individual, right? Because some people like like some people like to have a schedule. Some people are more fluid because it's so difficult to have a schedule. So I think it's it's it links back to what Colonel Ajay was saying earlier about empathy, right? It's It's really just about understanding what you need as an individual, right? And recognizing that, not everyone is the same. And uh, I, mean, I think goes back to the point, as managers come in, they need to recognize that, right, somewhere. 
so uh, it's more about how do i enable you the best as i can as you figure out what is it that you need uh, you know from uh, uh, from either the company or your manager or you know even from your family or your your staff or whatever it is right uh, so so absolutely i think uh, and any other thing that uh, you think individually we should uh, encourage people to do uh, anything else uh, you know from from your experiences so as you rightly said it is uh, mainly what applies to them and what makes them feel happy so mm-hmm. it could be some people may not like exercising some people may not like meditation at all so it's not about forcing yourself into it and doing it and making this that itself more stressful it could be just just sitting idle and you know like uh, aditya mentioned just watching netflix i mean that itself yes. is good enough it's all about you know coming up with i mean having that time that whatever half an hour 20 minutes 15 minutes for time and look for what you can do to relax yourself it could be just sleeping itself don't overburden yourself with the list of things which is thrown at you with so many forwards and so many things don't get carried away just pick one or two which is the most useful for you and what makes you feel happy you know it could be anything it could be as simple as just sitting idle and do nothing i just look you know stare at the wall or stare at the uh, outside the window okay so it's up to you don't over stress yourself that oh i didn't do exercise and that get stressed about that itself okay absolutely so now uh, i'm going to open it uh, we have some audience questions coming in so i will uh, that's why i'm looking at my phone <laughs> as i look through the audience questions uh, so the first question that we have from sharad and he's asking uh, you know what proactive steps uh, you know uh, that we're seeing organizations are taking now and actually uh, as we pivot and we've been in the pandemic now for 7 to 8 months almost uh, so what proactive steps are organizations taking to restore the confidence of employees uh, so that they, they do not get anxious or stressed and also uh, what initiatives have been taken to train hr professionals uh, you know to handle this unusual situation so maybe colonel ajay we could start with you for perspective do you want me to repeat the question or i have got the question thank you okay. see i think a lot of the uh, thank you a lot of the answers to this uh, particular aspect were brought out by aditya raidi in the beginning mm-hmm. there are organizations who are uh, assuring their workforce that their jobs are secure there are organizations who are providing healthcare the way aditya had suggested there are organizations who are aligning with the structures which preeti had brought out they are providing training to their people to deal with this okay i am working with uh, a few organizations where i'm coaching them specifically to deal uh, coaching senior managers on how to implement uh, processes for uh, dealing with people who have uh, covid uh, problems at home or who are insecure or who are facing semi psychological issues because it's only an expert who can decide whether this is psychological or not psychological so before that whatever steps we can take we must take now having said that all organizations unfortunately are not as sensitive especially those organizations where the workforce is easily replaceable they are tending to be slightly more callous about it which is sad wherever there is a specialist workforce where the cost of replacement is going to be tremendous all these measures automatically come in because it's a, then it's a question of survival of the organization itself where people are replaceable this sentiment is not as much as it should be mm-hmm. so i'm sure aditya would have a, a you know much more information on this than i have uh, as to what is happening on uh, global scale so maybe he i think kanal aja has uh, brought out all the relevant points right so i think beautifully captured and uh, nicely encapsulated Uh, the one thing which I definitely uh, think HR organizations are starting to do, and uh, to the question asked by Sharad, is to practice resilience. And how do we build that as a skill with managers and as individuals? Right, uh, both within the HR fraternity and outside outside the fraternity. So, I would say uh, I would urge uh, individuals, leaders, or uh, you know HR leaders to kind of explore this more to see how they can build more resilience within their teams and also the larger organization. Absolutely. Uh, 
So I, the other question, I think we touched upon this a little bit, and uh, you know, Dr. P. P. Nidhi, I'll uh, ask this to you. Uh, women specifically, I think, are undergoing a lot more stress, right? And as we have the equality and inclusion agenda, where we do want, uh, we do feel like, uh, you know, retaining. I mean, obviously, it's it's a big priority for organizations to have uh, women specifically, uh, you know, on 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 workforce, etc. But today, it's exceptionally difficult, right? And I can talk from our own experiences, Doctor. We've actually uh, asked uh, female technicians, like plant technicians, who have children that we we can't get them to work because there's no alternate childcare arrangement. And obviously, in a manufacturing facility, you can't get them to work from home, right? But for those women who are working from home today, uh, you know how how do we battle sort of home children, uh, you know, work at home, in laws possibly, or parents or whatever it is. How? Any advice or anything you have seen from your experience that you would like to share? Yeah. So uh, yeah. So I I I'm struggling myself with all of that. But the way I would look at it myself or or managers to you know child are children are easily adaptable. I mean if you can, I mean it depends on the age group. But generally they are very easily adaptable and they are able to understand. We believe that they were not able to understand. But if you can actually sit and explain, they get it. Uh, that is one thing. The most important thing uh, for a working uh, mother and. I know, working women. It's very important to take support. I mean, never hesitate to take support, no matter whoever it is. You know, I mean, now I'm sure, and I know that nowadays maids are not something which is an option with us. But whatever support that you have, forget about what they're going to think. You know, it's all about how to make that work together and not think beyond what is required. Generally, what we do is even even if we are handing over our child. to our in-laws or our parents to look after even though they are agreeing we always have this in our mind that what will they think you know it will be too much of a burden to them how will they manage so that causes more stress than the actual event itself so how do we kind of explain that to ourselves it's okay i mean you know you did your best and let's stop it at that and let's not worry more than what they can do so take support of whatever possible mm-hmm. explain to your children about what is happening there easily i mean plan it advance so that they are occupied uh, with you know of course there are online classes and other things that they like to do okay so these are the only ways i mean i, I don't see there's another way apart from bringing a structure and planning and uh, in taking support uh, from available system you know uh, i mean we all agree that we want to be superwoman doing everything possible but it's it's in the process we are failing ourselves which we don't realize by being a superwoman okay of course there are certain things which our spouses can do let them do it even if they do a little bit of a messy job or even if they do you know uh, not do as as per your way it's okay let them just do it and let's step out and, and close our eyes towards it so these are the things that we create the stress ourselves rather than you know uh, actual stress so once we are able to stop that you know okay let that be managed and i can handle it it gets very easier absolutely so i think that's and i think somewhere uh, basically just give yourself a break right it's okay yes yes break with the right uh, right stop on your mind because our mind doesn't stop even if physically we've moved <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely so i i can relate and i think that's that's a great point that uh, basically ask for help uh, you know uh, ask for even uh, with your manager i mean feel free to move meetings or right. ask for things to be you know moved around Take, uh, take, yeah. Make use of all the support system available, exactly. farthest, farthest exactly. possible. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, so, a few more questions that we have. So, one was most of the time, I think, uh, and linked to that, right? And I think we talked about this a little bit, but I don't know if there's anything else that any of you want to add. So, the question is: most of the times, work doesn't allow us to take care of ourselves and take out time for the family. Uh, doing things that we like, and how can we manage our time more efficiently? And we touched upon this with structure, you know, allowing, asking for help, etc. And so delegation. Said, delegation is the other delegation one. Delegation yeah. is mm-hmm. important. Delegation, especially, even in your team, actually, or asking for more resources, sure. potentially asking for more support, maybe anything else that anyone would like to add here. 
Sure, uh, Richard, there's one thing I would do want to add. I think as yeah. organizations, there is a responsibility which organizations carry during these times to see uh, which activities can be paused and which activities need to be done at this point of time, right? Because mm -hmm. not all of it is important. You know, you, these are good things to do. So there's a lot of stress within the system in terms of uh, helping resources or helping employees and uh, managing with day-to-day -day, uh, uh, situations and challenges, right? So in Intel, we've kind of pro uh, proactively identified things we want to postpone by a few quarters or said in 2020 we're not going to do this or invest any resources in this and that creates a certain amount of bandwidth and certain amount of space for people to uh, go and then tackle other challenges which are more important and pressing so as organizations i would strongly urge each of them to look at their activities and to uh, ruthlessly, ruthlessly prioritize what is important and what is not Yes, absolutely. So prioritization, almost like uh, Covey's matrix, like urgent, not urgent, important, not important, all the absolutely. not important. Uh, absolutely. Uh, great point. Anything else on that before I move on? I think we take one more question and then any other perspective on that specific one? Okay. Uh, so I think the, uh, the last question, which, which is uh, I'm going to take is uh, from Sharad on, I think, what the the question is most of the human related issues uh you know we're, we're trying to figure out and what about the government i think the question is can the government or uh, you know regulatory bodies do anything uh, to enable uh, the situation and i think that's i mean we haven't really touched upon it so it's a good thing to consider what, what do governments or regulatory organizations or maybe industry associations you know what role can they play uh, in the current context and maybe Ajay, uh, Colonel Ajay, if you would like to start. Sure. Any uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I have very, very strong views on this. <laughs> so I picked the right <laughs> panelist to that day. <laughs> because we, this is again something which is letting us down. We expect somebody to tell us what to do. Yes. yes. We need to let our own conscience and our own, you know, uh, good place govern our actions. Why do you want somebody to tell you that don't lay off people? Why do you want somebody to tell you sustain the organization? Why do you want somebody to tell you reduce the profit margin and use the profits elsewhere like uh, Aditya was suggesting? The whole point is just that why do we want to wait for the government to step in and tell us to do stuff? Most of us are human beings. We are at various places in organizations. We all have conscience. We all have uh, relatives, parents and stuff. Uh, we've also seen, I mean, uh, a worker loses his uh, mother-in-law or father. That happens to top management as well. So if under this situation of great tragedy, we cannot come together and put together a plan for the future. Uh, it is our own fault. I, in one of the presentations I was giving, I, uh, similar questions were asked, of course, not related directly to the government. They, I suggested something what I call the five P's. The five P's are very simple. There is, was, and may continue a pandemic. Initially, it created panic. Now we are after the panic. Let's ponder what we need to do. Then we need to prepare for what we want to do. Once we do this, we will prosper. So like Aditya was sharing something about uh, how profits have been, you know, uh, or prioritization has, has taken place. One step further would be instead of waiting for the government to tell us to do things, the ecosystem of that organization should function actually as an ecosystem. Let's look at it as one big joint family and let's see how we can work together to create a win-win situation. For example, let's say there are 10, uh, 10 mothers uh, with small children and they're all required to go to work. Why can't these 10 mothers along with the organization create a small crash there and manage those children on a shift basis so that at least eight of them get to work on a rotational basis. 
you see how google has managed their campuses pre covid uh, where they literally provide you everything on ca campus why do you want the government to come and tell you to do this stuff now if you want to grow as an organization if you want to prosper put these things into place create this culture from now we are 6 months plus into the pandemic we may be here for at least another year we may be here for another 5 years we do not know we cannot wait for this time to go past and somebody to tell us we need to act from the best intent possible please mark my words the best intent possible for all of us it's like we are on a spaceship and that spaceship is in trouble unless we get our act together that spaceship is not going anywhere Actually, I just want to quickly add on to it. I know we are out of time, but just want to uh, take what thirty seconds to just add on to this. I think one thing I've been pleasantly surprised since the pandemic has hit us is how open governments have been in terms of listening to our needs, right? So we've, um, in fact, across across Asia, we've uh, used our industry bodies to be able to go and have conversations with government and say that these are needs we have which you cannot ignore because uh, we are a very manufacturing focused company. We have half our population in Asia is actually in the factories, so. it would cripple us if the government would say that you have to shut your factories down right so in uh, countries like malaysia vietnam taiwan china wherever we've had restrictions earlier uh, we've gone back and proactively worked through the industry organizations uh, to work with the government to say these are sops we'd love to follow and in some cases the government has said why don't you give us the sops and we will replicate that right um, and uh, they've been very open and willing to listen and i've been very pleasantly surprised because i think the governments at some point acknowledge that they they not have all the resources and all the answers in terms of figuring this out right nobody does so we all need to kind of uh, help each other out so that's that's a call out so don't be afraid to ask for help like priti said and don't be afraid to say that this is what you need even if it's with the government yes absolutely thank you uh, great point so uh, with that let me just uh, uh, close Uh, you know uh, today's discussion right i'm uh, supposed to uh pick the best question so and i don't know if any of you have a point you would like to ask <laughs> you as well uh so i i personally uh, uh, would like to uh, pick the question that pp asked on the women employees and you know how they're managing because we didn't really touch upon it we did at that point So I pick that. Uh, so uh, Priyanka, you can make a note of that. Congratulations to Preeti, and uh, with that, I'd like to thank all of you once again. Uh, I think the, we talked, we touched upon pretty much the four aspects. We talked about governments. We talked about you know what what they can do, and I think uh, being more open to corporates as well as individuals as sort of driving an organization driving their own agenda. We talked about organizations. how to create a culture of trust psychological safety empathy uh, you know what uh, to invest in the right programs to be transparent as much as possible pick up on what employees need uh, you know engage meaningfully with their employees and try to do uh, like uh, you know karl rajaj ajay also mentioned what is the best intent and how do i meet my objective um, you know while maintaining the right kind of culture we talk a little bit about you know what managers can do Uh, i love the uh, you know training program uh, dr vidhi that you mentioned i'm going to recommend it uh, you know to us in png because i don't see us uh, doing it enough actually honestly and i'm seeing an escalation of you know health issues uh, specifically in our own organization in india uh, and uh, <clears throat> so that that's the manager piece that we talked about and we also talked about employees and i think you know taking control and sort of asking for help and sort of doing the you know you're playing your role i think that was the biggest takeaway for me as well which i don't think we encourage employees to do a lot of right we we tend to be very very paternalistic as organizations where we sort of you know spoon feed a lot of people right so uh, that's i think the last uh, thing that you know i took away uh, so thank you very much for all your time and investment right uh, i just want to reiterate on felicity just a couple of closing thoughts so felicity has been created with the idea of you know connecting professionals like all of you uh, in the field of mental health and obviously to make the world a more happier place uh, they follow the motto of talk resolve and heal and uh, you know just to come and talk about their feelings 
and they have a vast pool of people who are available 24/7 you can just book a session with them in five simple steps i'd encourage you to follow felicity on all social media platforms and you can access more content related to mental wellness and stay updated on upcoming events and uh, obviously you can uh, follow they have a site and uh, they will have such more we will have such more webinars going on in the future so do follow them on social media felicity care and felicity, www.felicity.care right uh, thank you all of you once again it was a pleasure uh, you know hosting this webinar uh, any closing thoughts comments anything from any of you in summary before we sign off for the day we're already a few minutes late but if there's anything i would love to hear it Harisha, I just wanted to tell you about the manager training. So most of the companies have EAP uh, service provider. Yeah. So yeah. most uh, PNG might also have. So yeah. they have this training programs uh, readily available. So you can okay. just approach them and they can do that for your managers, which is uh, ready with them. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I think if we integrate it in existing manager training, that would be exactly. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. It, it. I have made it like a mandatory training programs yeah. because it's very important part of as you become a manager. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, Panelaja. I have a closing thought for all our viewers and uh, everybody who's affected by this. Charles Darwin said that uh, it is the survival of the fittest. There is a slight change to that. It is no longer the survival of the fittest. It is the survival of the most adaptable. So let's all adapt. to this new environment understand it be one with it and thrive that's the only way to move ahead absolutely thank you are there anything from you you know that's that was wonderfully put back on laja i don't think i can uh, beat that in terms <laughs> of uh, ending to the session so but it was lovely having uh, all of us on the session i i loved the discussions right so thank you to all of you and thanks yeah, to the chat same here yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, much. and Thank most welcome. Yeah.